Many programmers structure data as atomic units that bundle together related items like a person's name and gender or the x, y, and z coordinates of a three-dimensional point. This means that in software, if we had three points that we wanted to move, we would need to perform one addition instruction for each coordinate in a point. In a standard loop, this means it would take us three iterations to transform all three points. This processing method is known as single instruction, single data, or SysD. This is the simplest and most familiar model, but scalar processing like this doesn't fully utilize modern CPUs. Single instruction multiple data, or SIMD, is a different form of processing where one operation is performed on many items in parallel. Going back to our 3D point example, let's turn our data 90 degrees conceptually into what's called a structure of arrays. Now instead of having many point instances, we can store all x, y, and z values separately in three arrays within a single structure. Our data is still related in a way that helps us reason about it, but is now in a form that's much easier for SIMD instructions to work with. This is because homogeneous elements which are packed together can be efficiently loaded into these vector registers, allowing these registers to be operated on as a unit. I'll first go over some background, followed by a very simple example in assembly to build some context. Afterwards, I'll show a CPU-based ray tracer, which exclusively uses SIMD across multiple cores as a case study for how we can dramatically increase throughput. On x86-64 CPUs, a long history of extensions have been released to give us anywhere from 64 to 512 bit wide vector registers to perform these SIMD instructions on. This is why utilizing SIMD is typically called vectorizing code. This type of processing isn't unique to the CPU architecture or to CPUs at all. However, for the rest of the video, I will be referring to x86 and x64 processors only. The MM registers were added first through MMX to support 64 bit SIMD instructions. SSC was later introduced to include 128-bit XMM registers. Instead of being located separately, the MM registers simply take up the bottom 64 bits of the XMM registers. In 2011, AVX was released, which introduced 256-bit registers using the YMM naming and similarly extended the existing register space. Currently, most consumer-grade CPUs have these YMM registers, but newer 512-bit ZMM registers can be found on higher-end and server CPUs now. To demonstrate how these registers really work, I'll use assembly to calculate the dot product between a thousand pairs of three-dimensional vectors. I'll also do this in a loop for 10 million total iterations to get some decent metrics. I'll first use scalar processing with an array of structures where each structure is a triplet of floats for the x, y, and z coordinates. So there will be two total arrays, each storing 1,000 of these structures. I'm going to be using flat assembler, which uses the Intel syntax. In other words, the destination operand comes before the source operand for an instruction. Conceptually, this is similar to saying A plus or equals B, where add is the operation, A is the destination, and B is the source. At a high level, I reserve space for my data on the stack, fill the arrays, and create two loops for the iteration logic. The important part lies in these six instructions, which all begin with V to denote they are vector instructions. They also end with SS to denote that they operate on scalar, single precision floats. I first move an x, y, and z value from the first array into xmm0 through 2. The next three instructions multiply these with the corresponding values in the other array and add these into xmm0 to complete the dot product. Note that vector registers are used for both scalar and parallel instructions, which may clear up some confusion on why I'm using these registers for single floats. This scalar code requires 10 billion total iterations through our loops and takes an average time of 5,244 milliseconds or about 5.2 seconds when using the perf benchmarking tool. Let's create two structures of arrays, which both hold their own x, y, and z arrays. I align these structures to a 32 by boundary so I can efficiently load 256 bit chunks at a time into my registers, but otherwise it's the same. I'm still using effectively the same six instructions to calculate my dot products. However, they now end with PS. This stands for packed single precision floats. It means that the instruction will operate on all eight floats in the register in parallel. We're now loading eight X, Y, and Z values at a time and performing the multiplication and addition logic to the registers as a whole, which will yield eight dot products afterwards. This means that we only need 125 iterations to get through all 1000 elements in our structures. Using perf again, we see that our average time using SIMD dipped to 640 milliseconds. This is a little over eight times faster than our scalar program. Assembly is usually not the most ergonomic way of accessing SIMD instructions explicitly, so Intel intrinsic functions and various SIMD libraries exist for higher level languages that allow you to use these features while sticking to your language of choice. Let's now look at my SIMD implementation of Peter Shirley's Ray Tracing in One Weekend. 
This is a great use case for vectorization as each ray in a ray tracer is independent and you've got millions if not billions of rays to calculate. I'm using Intel Intrinsic Functions to access MD, which provide a very thin wrapper over the assembly vector instructions I showed you. My main render function iterates over the rows and columns of an image, and for each pixel, loops over the number of samples we want to collect for a pixel. Each iteration of the sample loop finds the ray colors for 8 rays in parallel. This means that 3 iterations of this loop would actually calculate 24 ray samples in total. The more rays you shoot into a pixel, the better the final image, since you have more data to average for the final color. This means that over a scalar implementation, you need to do a lot less work to get the same fidelity of your render. If we look a little further into where we find our ray colors, we see a loop that finds the places that our rays actually hit an object, which in our case are spheres. In a scene with many objects, we loop over all of them and just keep track of which one is the closest so that we can render it. After we create a record of which spheres we hit, we update the color of the ray to account for the object's color and we scatter the ray based off the object's material. I'm buffering my writes for slightly better performance, but the main idea is that after I collect the final colors for a group of pixels, I average the colors by how many samples we collected, convert them all from floats to 8-bit unsigned integers, and write them out to the image buffer. I'll be comparing my implementation to Peter Shirley's scalar version, which was used in his book. The only change I made was implementing a linear congruential random number generator to replace his use of the SCD RAND function. I used it to speed up my pseudo random number generation in my implementation, so I felt that it was fair to do the same with his. Besides the small spheres being placed slightly different due to randomization and using different colors, the two scenes are identical. There are 488 total objects, a maximum ray bounce depth of 20, and 400 rays per pixel being rendered at 1080p. When ran on a single thread, Shirley's version took 31.4 minutes to render the scene. The highly vectorized version took 4.9 minutes. Our version was 6.4 times faster, which may be surprising as some of you may expect it an 8 times speed up, but I have some possible ideas. For one, simony instructions can cause clock speeds to be reduced slightly. Additionally, not every task you want to do in scalar code is immediately representable in vectorized code. For instance, to update the values of single rays, you can't simply index to a position in the register as if it were an array. The rest of our theoretical performance loss is likely due to some mistake on my part, so I would love for you guys to go and try finding bottlenecks. If you find something worthwhile, please open an issue or pull request on GitHub and I'll mention you in my next video. Lastly, I want to compare Shirley's implementation to a multi-threaded version of our vectorized code. I use standard async to spawn 60 concurrent render tasks, splitting the image evenly among them. With the same parameters as before, render time went down to 48.7 seconds. This was a 38.7 times increase over Shirley's code and a 6 times increase over my single threaded version. Additionally, it makes sense that I'm seeing a 6 times increase, since my CPU has 6 hardware cores that support AVX2. While this video is focused on SIMD, I think it's still important to realize the performance benefits of creating more parallelized programs when appropriate. Clock speeds aren't getting much faster currently, and hardware manufacturers are focusing a lot on throughput through wider vector registers and more cores. While modern compilers can do a decent job of vectorizing code for you, they can't fix your data architecture in a way that allows these instructions to be performed in the first place. This is why it's so important to understand and become experienced with what you're ultimately building for, which is hardware. While best practices and programming patterns can help reason about a program for some teams, they're subjective and may or may not agree with how a processor is optimized to operate on data. At the end of the day, the benefits of these ideas aren't always tangible, but seem to get far more attention than the platform we as programmers actually run our code on. Cutting out the bullshit, getting your hands dirty, and being informed about your hardware's capabilities lets you understand whether or not your programs are running at their full potential and makes you a better decision maker. Thanks.